Jean-Paul Marchand of SEI Forums and a senior partner at Energy Invest. So uh, Jean-Francois, it's all yours. Thank you, Nathan. So hi, everyone. So I'm very pleased to be your host and moderator for this uh, webinar uh, today focusing on uh, the social housing. So my name is Jean-Francois Marchand. I'm a co-founder of Energy Invest, a Brussels-based uh, consulting company specialized in energy efficiency uh, investment. I'm currently uh, assisting uh, the executive agency for SMAs in implementing uh, the Sustainable Energy Investment Forum initiative. So a few words uh, on the initiative. So uh, this webinar is part of a series organized by ASM uh, uh, in the context of the Sustainable Energy Investment Forum initiative. This initiative started four years ago and aims uh, to bring together the stakeholders of the energy efficiency sector and the financing sector in order to foster the dialogue around uh, energy investment, sustainable energy investment uh, in Europe and to develop built uh, additional or uh, increased capacities uh, for the market. So the initiative is based on the smart building, uh, smart financing for smart building uh, pillars, the three pillars of uh, this previous European initiative. Basically, we aim to promote uh, aggregation of projects by developing, for instance, uh, uh, one-stop shopping uh, solutions, but also to de-risk energy uh, efficiency investments uh, with appropriate tools and to make a better use of uh, public funding, uh, specifically to uh, leverage uh, private finance on the market. So to accomplish its goals, uh, the Sustainable Energy Investment Forum uh, initiative organized various events, such this present webinar, but also uh, national conferences and uh, national roundtables uh, in uh, member states. Uh, recently, uh, SUF organized two roundtables, one in Finland and another one in Croatia, and uh, several additional events will be organized in the two years to come. So I will invite you just to keep informed regularly on the uh, SEF website on the current event that are forecast. So let's come to the topics of today. So Sustainable Energy Investment Forum has choose to focus uh, topics uh, on the social housing sector as part of uh, the implementation of uh, the new coming uh, renovation wave initiative from the European Commission. Maybe you may wonder why uh, social housing is a key uh, sector for the implementation of uh, this initiative and why it's also quite important for a sustainable energy investment forum. The answer is quite simple, uh, basically the snowball effect for the entire housing uh, market. So the housing, uh, social housing sector represents today almost uh, 25 million uh, dwellings in Europe. It's about 12% of uh, the whole uh, residential building stock uh, in Europe. Uh, but uh, the social housing sector is also a well uh, united and organized sector. Uh, building more than 2,000 uh, new uh, units a year and renovating about the same uh, amount of existing drilling uh, yearly. So this illustrates uh, the potential leverage effect of uh, the social housing sector, basically to increase the renovation wave, uh, the renovation rate uh, in Europe uh, in the years to come. But also over the last decades, uh, the social housing sector has been driving uh, innovation in the building sector by uh, building uh, neutral energy uh, new houses, but also integrating a smart building uh, element into design of uh, uh, new buildings and developing new approach in renovation, such as the neighborhoods and communities approach. So this also is a key element uh, to increase uh, the, the, the market knowledge in the future. And in this context of the renovation wave, uh, the sector has a, a key role to play in further testing and scaling up uh, new techniques uh, in uh, building construction as well as in the development of uh, new business model and innovative financing mechanism. 
Nevertheless, and despite uh, this central role, uh, the social housing sector face uh, remaining challenge and barriers uh, that still need to be tackled in the years to come. Uh, some of them are well known. Uh, we can speak about uh, the split incentive barrier or uh, the specific uh, complexity, contractual complexity inherent to the sector. But uh, financing remains the main challenge that will have to be uh, overcome in the future. Basically, uh, budgetary pressure on uh, the sector has led uh, to a decrease of uh, the quality and the numbers of existing dwellings. And in the same time, uh, the growing needs for new accommodation uh, urge uh, the needs to, to build uh, several new uh, and massive new uh, housing in Europe. Uh, so in this uh, circumstance, the consequence are for the sector that they face a huge financing gap which is, for instance, estimated to be at least at 10 million euro a year only for the renovation of the existing dwelling. So this is uh, the, core, uh, the, the core of uh, this webinar. And today the speaker will attempt uh, to provide some answers and, uh, to those questions and to draw first line of actions. Uh, basically, we will have uh, five presentations. Uh, the first will be by uh, Paula Ray Garcia, which is Deputy Head of Unit at the DGNR uh, uh, at the European Commission. She will introduce us with uh, the specific element, the main element of the new uh, Renovation Wave initiative. Uh, she will be followed by Sosha Edwards, which is the Secretary General of Housing Europe, the European organization grouping all the social housing uh, operator. And she will give us uh, an overview of the social housing sector, uh, also their accomplished uh, achievements, the challenge and the recommendation uh, they have for the future. Uh, uh, she will be followed by Claudia Kahani. Uh, she is a project coordinator for the Energy Agency of the region of Modena in Italy. And she will present the result of a very interesting uh, project, the Lemon Project, which is a, an Horizon 2020 funded project. So we, it was focusing uh, on combining uh, existing public funds, uh, national and European one, with ESCO financing uh, to fund deep uh, social uh, renovation uh, projects. So after that, we will have a presentation from uh, Tanguy de Rousseau, uh, which is head of public sector and infrastructure division at the European Investment Bank. He will uh, explain us uh, the interest uh, for the sector of uh, eu back investment platform. Uh, and presenting uh, a first example and several examples that has been implemented uh, during the, the, the EFSI, previous EFSI uh, framework, uh, basically the French Réseau Canopé uh, investment platform and several other, but also introducing uh, what the IB can offer to the social sector for the, the, the funding of their projects. And finally, uh, we will have a presentation of Joost de Klerk, which is a promoter energy efficiency uh, within the Belgian bank, uh, Belfius. And he will present uh, a new package that has been developed uh, with the support of uh, the European Investment Bank, the B package, uh, the Belgian energy efficiency package that offer uh, uh, funding for uh, energy efficiency projects through uh, the private sector, uh, notably uh, through ESCO financing and uh, EPC contracting. And they will showcase some example that has been implemented in Belgium. So just before uh, to start, uh, just remind for the uh, housekeeping rules. So um, the recording of the webinar will be available on the website of uh, the Sustainable Energy Investment Forum uh, just after uh, the webinar. Uh, I remind you that at the end of each presentation, uh, we will have a small time for a Q&A session uh, and you can ask your questions through uh, the application by using uh, the chat window buttons. Note that uh, the presentation of uh, Mrs. Ray Garcia will not be followed by a Q&A session, only the other ones. So, uh, but anyway, we will uh, then direct the question to the panelists. And if you have any questions for Mrs. Ray Garcia, you can 
anyway, uh, address them uh, within the system and we will uh, reply to your questions later. Uh, uh, basically, the Sustainable Energy Investment Forum team will re reply uh, later to you. So I'm very glad to, to give the floor now to uh, Paul Ray Garcia for his uh, first presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and, and uh, good morning to, to everybody. It's uh, really a pleasure for me to take part in this Sustainable Energy Investment Forum uh, webinar. And in fact, today's subject and, and the focus really on the renovation of social housing is really central to the Renovation Wave Initiative that I will be presenting to you. Um, I'm just putting a bit. the volume. So um, you are, are probably familiar with, with uh, at least some elements of the Renovation Wave Initiative. It was adopted last week on the 14th of October, and it's really a pleasure for me to, to introduce it to you. Um, I imagine that in the end, what I will be presenting may be just a, a brief go through the initiative because it's quite a, a detailed and encompassing uh, communication and action plan. We have also put together a staff working document outlining the main um, funding, EU funding tools that are available. And together with this initiative, there were other uh, very important uh, developments like the adoption on the same day of the recommendation on energy poverty. So there is quite a lot of material in our website that may be interested uh, for those attending this webinar to, to consult afterwards. Um, so moving then into my, my first slide, um, why this focus on renovation? Why now is the commission putting so much attention on the renovation of buildings and launching this uh, very visible and, and very um, yeah, central to the, to the communication efforts also of our president and vice president initiative on, on the renovation wave. So in this slide, um, we have put together a bit the key numbers that relate to, to buildings and the main figures. And I think that this really speaks for, the, for themselves because with the uh, increased ambition uh, with increased ambition of the of the climate target plan and the move towards a 55% emission reduction target by 2030. The only way for the EU really to, to meet this uh, target for 2030 and more broadly the 2050 decarbonization challenge is for the EU really to tackle buildings and their energy performance on the one side, but also more largely their greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, there are some of the figures listed here uh, for greenhouse gas emissions. By 2030, we should be reducing them in buildings by around 60%, which is quite a lot. Uh, but also we should tackle final energy consumption uh, of buildings uh, significantly. And the same would go also for more specifically the heating and cooling consumption that takes place in buildings. So um, with this in mind, the, the objectives of, of the renovation wave uh, really have uh, to do with tackling the potential in existing buildings, because it's there where really the, the figures come uh, to, to, uh, to reality. And in this sense, we have been over the last two years collecting data on uh, current renovation rates of existing buildings across the EU. And the findings really make very clear that on the one hand, the renovation rate is, is very, very low, but also that the renovations that do actually happen are too shallow. They very often do not tackle energy performance. And this is really, in our view, a, a missed opportunity because it's also an area that if we uh, now boost it and increase the renovation rates, it brings many, many benefits. So uh, beyond the climate and, and energy benefits, there is also job creation. There is, of course, the, the indoor air quality, um, better health, uh, less noise. So there are a number of benefits that are very important 
and that could be really grasped uh, if we manage to put in place this, this renovation wave in the coming years. But putting it in place requires actions uh, at every level. Uh, it's not only at EU level that needs to take place, it's fundamental that member states also engage. And beyond that, local and regional authorities, different stakeholders, uh, and then really going into the details. So also the social housing community, if we think about uh, the topic of, of the webinar of today. So to make this, uh, this happen is requiring really a, a large transformation. And I move to my next slide. So uh, we are aware that it's really a truly transformative agenda. But this is also very much determined by our climate uh, neutrality ambitions. So it really requires a lot of rethinking of, of how things have been happening and how to take them to the next level in a way. And because the building sector is really very, very granular, very diverse, but also because um, it cuts across many other policy areas, uh, what we saw is that we really need a, a truly integrated strategy that encompasses um, quite a broad range of, of sectors. And uh, you can see them in, in this slide. Um, it's on the one hand, the promotion of life cycle thinking of circularity, further developing what was put forward in the, in the circular economy action plan of, of March uh, this year, uh, so that we also um, use the opportunity to turn buildings from a carbon source as they are today, towards a carbon sink. Um, it also means tackling the, the challenges of green and digital transition and doing that together and really um, boosting as much as possible and promoting smart buildings and also using buildings to help the rollout of uh, infrastructure for electric vehicles. And in fact also, um, and it was mentioned briefly in the introduction, it requires uh, really to um, address building renovation and, and renewables both at, at the house level, at the building level, but also at the district or, or city level, because this uh, will be necessary for delivering faster and deeper renovation rates. So if I move then to my next slide, um, really um, what I, I think we skipped the one slide. Is that possible? An earlier one, a previous one. No, sorry, it's this one and then followed by this one. Okay, because there was one with the key principles. Okay. If not, I can explain without, uh, without the slide. Um, so before the one uh, that you are seeing, um, my idea was to have a slide um, also explaining how this new vision for building renovation um, and the renovation wave communication really identifies key principles for, a, for an integrated approach um, that encompass uh, the, the principles that um, that uh, are listed in the in the communication from energy efficiency first to the respect of high environmental health and, and architectural quality, but also, for instance, ensuring affordability. And this is very important. This is really fundamental to have this principle really forming the, the renovation wave uh, to ensure that uh, in line with the clean energy transition goals that nobody is left behind and that renovation wave is social inclusive. This is really uh, very important for us and it means that uh, making uh, buildings energy performing and, and sustainable um, needs to be also available uh, for medium and lower income households and for vulnerable period, uh, people and, and areas. And it also means in fact, um, adjusted financing. 
So having financing solutions for uh, low-income household, households, um, also for cost neutrality, addressing uh, the rents issue, whether the rent is impacted by the increase in energy performance. It requires also the use of grants more than in, in in other areas, for instance, when we talk about social housing or worse performing buildings, um, looking into how to possibly subsidize renovation measures with the use of the savings uh, that will come from the renovation uh, to repay for the investment, so that in the end, the upfront investment is really limited to the grants that are available. And it also requires looking into innovative financing schemes. So that, for instance, uh, we look into microcredits um, with, uh, with a backup uh, of a guarantee fund or on bill financing or on tax financing. So there are a number of innovative financing approaches and many of these have been explored in other webinars by the Sustainable Energy Investment Forums that are quite relevant for affordability and then more generally for uh, for uh, social housing and for worse performing buildings. Um, so now the next slide, and apologies that it seems that uh, the one slide with the key principles, um, I, I may have not included in the, in the set of slides, but here what, uh, what we see is a recognition that this is not a new, new area at the same time and that we uh, do not start from scratch. This is an area where there is already a well-established legal framework. There are quite a lot of, of previous funding experiences and, and innovative finance, uh, financing already having been promoted and dedicated support, for instance, through smart finance for smart buildings. And there is also a governance framework in place, but um, we see that this has been especially effective for new buildings. Uh, but what we need now to make it more impactful is on the one hand to address the barriers through the whole value chain, to also reinforce the pull factors that we know have been effective, but uh, even more important to refocus on existing buildings and on renovation, because that is where the largest uh, potential remains. So if we move to the next slide, here, um, in recognition of, of uh, yeah, how large uh, the challenge is and the, that it requires addressing the different barriers that I was mentioning um, and that were also identified thanks to uh, uh, all the inputs that we got through the public consultation process and the preparatory process, we have been uh, identifying seven different areas of intervention that are necessary really to act on the different fronts and all the cross-cutting areas that are relevant for building renovation and with idea of uh, unlocking renovation for all buildings. So this is really across the board uh, what we see is necessary for a step change in the rate and in the depth of uh, renovation. Um, and if we move to the next slide, uh, what we have also um, try to put forward with the communication is that in addition to this focus all across the board and all across the whole building stock, um, it is necessary also to call for focusing policy and financing efforts on three specific focus areas. And these are the decarbonization of heating and cooling because of uh, the fact that 80% of energy consumption of buildings comes from heating and cooling and that in fact two thirds from fossil fuels, so it's really an area that requires now um, a lot of attention. The second one is renovation of public buildings and of social infrastructure more generally because it's not, it's not always publicly owned. And then the last one is uh, tackling energy poverty and worse performing buildings. So these areas, um, in our view, should be considered as a priority for policy and financing at all levels, from the European to the local level, because they offer, on the one hand, a huge potential for increasing renovation rates, um, but also um, the possibility to offer to citizens healthier and more comfortable buildings and to make it visible to them. Because if we think, for instance, about public buildings and social infrastructure, 
there uh, really the social and the energy gains come hand, hand in hand and they are more visible to, to citizens. So this is really an important, uh, an important area in our view. So if we move to the next um, slide, the renovation wave um, is, is very broad. This is really an integrated strategy and very encompassing, but it really places a very significant focus on social and affordable housing. And I will um, stop a bit longer in, in, this, uh, in this slide because um, here, uh, given the, the large needs identified in the communication for this uh, sector, but also the fact that, uh, as I was mentioning, the social and the energy and climate gains can really come together. Um, the communication on the renovation wave proposes to really uh, focus quite a lot of the legal financing and governance reinforcement to address the needs of, of social housing and more broadly to also tackle energy poverty and to prioritize improvement in, in those uh, buildings that have um, the worst performance. So uh, from a regulatory perspective, what we have announced is introduction of minimum energy performance standards for buildings with particular focus on worst performing buildings. And the reason for doing this is because um, our analysis has shown that really is one of the most impactful policy tools for addressing split incentives and also for being able to tackle both the rate and the depth of, of renovation uh, with this policy tool. They need to be carefully designed. They really need to uh, allow for flexibility and um, they need to be well combined with, with uh, support, including financial support. And this will be part of, of the revision of the legislation that will take place uh, next year. Besides regulation on the financing side, uh, social housing and worst performing buildings can really benefit uh, from, from ESCO based renovation, also from innovative financing, as I was mentioning before. But in addition, uh, it's really an area for uh, industrialization to, to, to really bring a lot of, of benefits, industrialization of building renovation, standardized approaches, but also for public and, and private alliances uh, to roll out uh, integrated renovation programs. So for this reason also, um, the idea that we have announced is also that uh, uh, we will put in place an affordable housing initiative and the plan now is to design how to um, pilot uh, 100 renovation district uh, programs and to um, also identify a plan for replicating them because in reality this would be really a start. We need many more than, than 100 but this would uh, then uh, use um, or really identify what is needed for, for replication in other parts of, of Europe. And the idea also is to, um, to put in place this affordable housing initiative as a cross-sectoral partnership also and make the link with, with social actors and um, try to involve residents um, and, and ensure social, social enga in, in engagement into the initiative. So um, with this, I, I think I have gone through a bit uh, the really the highlights of, of the initiative. Um, I think I only have one more slide, um, simply uh, reminding of the different benefits and before concluding for me it would be um, important to, to remind that uh, what we see now is that on the one hand there is of course uh, a need to address this sector but there is also a, a quite unique uh, chance now with the next generation EU, the next uh, multi-annual financial framework and also with the potential that the renovation has for job creation to contribute to recovery etc so that we really try to um, activate action at all levels to break down the, the longest standing barriers to, to build renovation and to uh, put the renovation wave in place and, and make it happen on the ground. 
So um, EU institutions alone and the EU level alone will not succeed. We really need to mobilize all actors at all levels. And this, of course, including sustainable energy investment forums and webinars and uh, other events that really can help us um, engage all the actors that, uh, that need to, to make this happen. So with this, I, I conclude my, my presentation and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So thank you very much, um, Mrs. Ray Garcia, for this interesting introduction to the Renovation Wave Initiative. Uh, before you leave, maybe one question. So when do you think uh, the details of uh, the initiative will be uh, announced, published uh, by the Commission? And uh, uh, because we are really waiting for that. you mean for for the renovation wave initiative yes and the renovation wave was, was adopted last week and and published last week so i'm not updated so thank you for the answer so i really have a look in detail on that uh, in the coming days to come thank you very much for your presentation now i give the floor to uh, Sash, uh, Sorsha edwards uh, from uh, housing europe uh, thank you Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It's uh, really nice to be here and uh, great to see you, Paula, even though it's not in person. Congratulations, congratulations on getting the, the communication out there. I really imagine it was a lot of work and I think it's a very good basis for the ongoing conversation with Housing Europe and, and with, the, with the national federations as well. So, um, yes, I have some minutes to go through a little bit and give a little bit the perspective of um, the sector. I think in the introduction, uh, Jean-Francois, you already gave a very good overview, but I will go into a little bit more detail. Um, so obviously, for those of you who are not familiar with us, that's, a, that's Housing Europe. Uh, we bring together um, the different uh, public, social and, and cooperative housing providers and have been representing them for over 30 years here in Brussels. Uh, working not only on energy efficiency, that's very important, but in general, working with the institutions for better regulation, finance and knowledge on housing in Europe. Um, we also see the sector as a, a potentially, with the right framework, a real driver of a fair green transition in Europe, and now increasingly um, very relevant, also a driver of a, of a fair recovery, which is the, the, the topic um, of the day. So uh, please go ahead, thanks a lot. As I said, these are um, the results of a study carried out by our Housing Europe Observatory to work together with the European Investment Bank. It's always difficult to get those figures back um, from around Europe, but these are the, the latest estimates from generated by my colleagues. Um, so an estimated 43,000 local housing organizations of diverse types around 25 million dwellings, as, as was pointed out, and then a rough estimate of the activity going on, about 200,000 new dwellings and 200,000 refurbished dwellings each year, with an estimated investment of 50 billion. I must point out that that forecast was made pre-COVID, and we've yet to have really um, realistic updated figures to, to hear about the, the impact of, of COVID on the sector. Thanks a lot, you can go on. Yes, uh, so you asked me to give a bit of an estimate on the needs going forward, considering that the scale of the challenge we have. And this, again, is, is an estimate of that. So if we want to bring all of that stock um, that I've mentioned up to an A or B standard, um, we would need to increase our forecasted renovation by an additional 200,000. And we estimate that that would require about 10 billion every year. So we're, we're using the basis of approximately um, 60,000 euro per dwelling. So that's a really um, average based on the pan-European um, feedback. Um, and again, I stress that those figures were calculated um, pre-COVID. So we, we need to know how the, how they are, the base figures are impacted by the, by the current pandemic. Thanks a lot. You can go on to the next one. Yes, you also asked me just to give a bit of an an insight into the, um, the representativity of the sector throughout Europe. And as you can see, it's extremely, extremely diverse. So um, on the ground, we have 
um, social housing providers, uh, typically rental housing at below market prices, but also the, the organizations in the sector provide affordable housing. Um, so they are um, closer to market rents, but also housing built for affordable access to ownership. And keep in mind also the cooperative housing, they're owned and managed by residents, groups, or nonprofit providers. And there you have a bit of an overview. You can see on the slide, the percentages, as you can see, ranging from 30% in Netherlands, 24% in Austria, 15% in France, and then going to down more at 9% in Ireland, but growing and at 4% in Italy. So you see a big diversity. Thanks a lot, you can go on. Yes, so why uh, renovating social housing? I think um, we see it as a key part of the, the puzzle to achieve the recovery that we need. I've included um, an image there from the OECD, OE, excellent OECD report from June, um, looking for the building back, back better. Um, aiming at well-being and inclusiveness, but aligning with our, our Paris goals. And we think the investment in the sector can really help also align with those broader goals that we're looking at. So you have to look at the return. So this is an, um, an investment, not a cost. So the return to the, to the national coffers via taxes, job creation. Keep in mind that that money saved on people's bills is also circulating um, in the local economy, in addition, and um, with that, obviously, we are we are saving money, which would otherwise be used to import energy and um, and keep power stations building new power stations. Um, also, I think what we see is in many of the projects, that um, we are reaching many people often on lower incomes or um, low to middle incomes. And I think this is we are all aware that if we want the energy transition to happen, we need everybody on board. And we've heard Vice President, Elective Vice President Timmermans repeat this, and we've heard it from Paula today. I think there's a general recognition that if everybody is not on board, it will be it will be very difficult to get this through. So I think investing in this part of the built environment will really ensure that we meet those uh, the needs of those people who are potentially um, at risk of exclusion. We also see, because of the scale, as mentioned, that testing up and upscaling cost optimal approaches, which can be then used in other sectors. So we see this role playing out in many of the, the, the local housing providers where they can really lead the way in, in looking at, um, for example, hybrid prefabrication um, methods um, or mass purchasing agreements, which really can, um, can, can then help the rest of the built environment um, by really testing those uh, and bringing down the cost of those. Um, we also see um, very, very in where the sector is strong, they can play a big role in the neighborhood approach. So we, we see in the renovation way, a stress on this neighborhood approach, this district approach, and we see where the sector is strong, they can work very successfully with local players to look, um, to, to look how to include other range of different tenures and other public buildings in the renovation process. And we see a recognition also that there's no bones about it. This is going to be one of the hardest nuts to crack in the, um, in the green transition in Europe and globally. And I think Europe is at an advantage in that we can work with those um, 43,000 local providers to really bring this forward and, um, and be leaders in this energy transition because we see that all over the globe, this is going to be a big, a big challenge because of the fragmentation of the ownership. Thank you very much. In the next slide. Okay. Uh, just a quick example, that a few examples that I brought in to illustrate the nature of the, the hybrid approach at local level and the integrated approach. So uh, those um, charts show the, um, the effectiveness of looking at also the, the energy supply when we look at renovating a district. So looking at how if you are also um, renovating the district heating and at the same time bringing up the quality of the dwellings, you can have a more affordable um, intervention with um, higher, higher um, fall in, in greenhouse gas emissions. And then we also see an example, this is growing, and we see through community energy, but also local, local production, local generation and consumption of energy, which I think has a big part to play, but still, even though the legislation is on the table, still isn't quite, isn't quite reaching its optimal level. Please go on. 
I go on to a few, a couple more. Oh yes, so this is an, another example where we take the holistic approach. An example coming from Sweden, where an intervention was extremely hol holistic, um, working with um, the the public housing provider, but also um, working with um, with local schools um, and local community players to work on a, on a improving the entire neighborhood in terms of livability. And we see a specific example there that worked in the Swedish context where they ad ad added an additional level onto the building, thereby helping with the cost of the renovation. Not possible everywhere, but um, still um, an example to look at. There, and then I just wanted to mention, so we heard at the start how important aggregation and bundling is going to be um, when we, if we want to really scale up the number of interventions and the quality of those interventions. So I wanted to highlight just three examples of where we see the national federations bringing together social housing providers, playing a key role in establishing a national, national framework. And of course, the financial framework is going to be crucial here, not only the regulatory framework. So here we see an interesting new alliance bringing together um, the, the national, the French National Housing Bank, the Caisse de Caisse de the French Federation, Union Sociale pour l'Habitat, but we're coming together with the Council of Europe Development Bank and the European Investment Bank. So I think what is going to be crucial um, is to simplify as much as possible the access to financing um, at local level. So we can be working at, at, at regional level or at national level at bringing different funds together, but on the ground it has to be as simple as possible for local actors to carry out those inclusive, integrated uh, refurbishment programs. So the next one, please. I picked an example, also quite a recent example coming from VVH in, uh, in Flanders. So this is the, the, um, the Regional Social Housing Federation that is um, working on also um, bundling of the, um, the introduction of PV across almost the entire social housing sector in the region and working with the European Investment Bank on an ELENA program, so technical assistance, to really scale up the, the rolling out of that solar PV and with a significant decrease in, in, in running costs of the building for, for tenants. And again, this aggregator role is going to be crucial. And I think it has to be one of the, the ways we work in the affordable housing initiative is looking not only at the 100 um, projects locally, but how and um, when we need to replicate those, what sort of frameworks we need at, at national or regional level. If you can go on to the next slide. as another example of where we see a strong uh, national agreement, which is really driving progress and which is really going to help um, channel the right finance into the sector. So that's the Dutch Climate Pact on Housing, where they have committed to getting 100,000 rental homes, natural grass free by 2022. And um, they've also brought in a renovation accelerator um, to work also very closely with them, um, with local heat, heating and cooling providers. Um, and in as part of this, there will be new insulation, insulation standards. Uh, so this um, national framework we see already providing that um, de-risking in a way the activities for the local providers and I think this is what is going to be going to be crucial going forward. Yes, thank you. You can go on to the next one. Yes, so you've also asked me quickly, so I realize time is really flying here. So um, um, Paula has very um, extensively summarize what was a huge body of work. And I would just summarize quickly the first conversations we've having, we've been having with members as a reaction to the published renovation wave. Uh, so we see some risks and opportunities and we also have some questions, but we see this also as the start of a conversation where we will be engaging on a regular basis with the sector and with you um, with the European institutions. So we see a potential risk around mandatory energy requirements if the right financing does not come through. Um, obviously the risk of higher standards without the appropriate compensation can increase the, the burden on the sector. And I think in the introduction you already highlighted that obviously we are in the middle also of a, of a housing crisis, a housing affordability crisis. So the, the focus if of, at local level is also about delivering um, to answer the need 
for, for new delivery of housing. So we have to see how the burden is, is carried at local level. And um, I think the Commission has really done a lot in, their, in identifying the flagships in guidance for member states when it comes to the recovery and resilience plan. So identifying local production of energy and renovation as flagship initiatives. But obviously there is work to be done to make sure this actually turns into the channeling of funds to local level. We very much welcome, Paolo, you mentioned this new affordable housing initiative as part of the renovation wave um, to support social housing projects, renovation, and this 100 districts, we're very excited about that. And we are starting to talk with members about identifying those, but also very much welcome the focus on livability and the, the focus on um, a way, way and opportunity to test new technology and put that at the forefront. Obviously, we still have to continue to look at how that's going to be funded. We see obviously the uh, recovery and resilience plan. We see the, few, the European structural funds. Um, but also potentially to look at sources such as the, the ETS and the type of innovative funding we're going to see later on today. Um, thank, we also obviously welcome the role for prefabricated solutions because we see this definitely as part of the solution going forward. We have questions about how the European Bauhaus will look, but that's for another session. Thanks, if you can go on. So um, we've been putting our, our um, head together on the, the type of um, projects that could be developed under that um, 100 district program. And um, we think it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity, as I said, to go to focus on the affordability, um, but not only of the rent, but the living costs of the rent, energy and charges um, to uh, generate employment with not only large contractors, but also SMEs. Um, to look at the notion, the local needs, for example, Mediterranean Balkans, which need to focus on earthquake resistance. So we see it as, as, a, as potentially um, a good laboratory to bring in the best possible approaches at district level around Europe. If you can go on. We also see it as a way to discuss the different possible uh, regulatory obstacles. Um, these are very varied across Europe and they really change from, um, from housing market and from housing system to housing system. But we see that the, the Affordable Housing Initiative could provide a space to have that feedback loop on obstacles, on bottlenecks that, on, that are on the ground, whether they be technical or legislative. Um, we see that this could give, um, it could be a space to look at issues around, difficulties around the application of EU procurement framework to, of, to often what are quite complex um, projects. The rent, uh, district renovation project can also be quite complex. We see that some member states, this is going quite smoothly. In others, the, there, there's um, a complexity still perceived around the, the use of EU procurement framework for such a, for such diverse, uh, for such a diverse activity. Um, we also hear feedback obviously, of the limitations because of the stability and growth pact, so the limits on investment um, at, at many at regional level and at local level. And obviously this investment, freeing of this investment is going to be crucial for both renovation and for new build. We hear also feedback um, on, on state aid rules. Sometimes they, they do not um, consider the scale of the investment needed. And um, obviously on the whole funding question, as I said earlier, the best way is to really simplify this um, for the actors on the ground. So it can be complex at a higher up level, but for the actors on the ground, this has to be simple. And what we estimate is that what we should be aiming at, particularly for those 100 projects, that we should be aiming at 50% um, subsidy and 50% loan to really get these, these projects going. So the last slide. Thank you very much for your time. I think we have a lot more information online through our Housing Evolutions Hub, so the type of projects that are being carried out and in Our Homes Are Deal. And we, we really want to work together and um, with the sector and with European institutions to find those solutions to renovate Europe for social and green transition. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Edwards. Um, so we have some questions from uh, the audience. Um, I will start with the first one. 
So uh, beyond the financing availability uh, within the social uh, housing sector, what has been the role of a facilitator or one-stop shop uh, to launch uh, the renovation initiative that you have deployed and mentioned in your presentation? Yes, so I think the financing, we can't underestimate how important that is, but we have also seen a key role being played in the testing of um, new technical solutions. So I think we there's a general agreement that we need to decarbonize the housing stock, but I think we still haven't got the 100% exactly the right solution when it comes to financing and when it comes to the technical solutions. But what we are seeing, for instance, that we can upscale significantly if we work, uh, for example, on hybrid and um, prefabricated um, methods for refurbishment. So we've seen these type of um, refurbishment methods being piloted in quite a few countries now. Um, um, and one of the examples is the energy sprung model, but there are other hybrid models in addition. And um, we see that this can really be um, an important multiplier role coming from the sector because the scale is there. Um, and we see this um, prefabricated uh, model. So we've just produced a webinar recently on that, analyzing the business case for that throughout the sector. And we estimate that it can be useful for about 30% of the, of the social housing stock and that uh, we, we, we can gather from what has happened so far that it's going to be part of the solution going forward, whether that's fully prefabrication for certain parts of the stock or whether that is a hybrid method. So I think this technical innovation is going to be crucial. And also where we see and some of our social housing providers really continue to put this at the forefront and that is how to work together with residents. So we have seen um, um, successful co-creation methods where um, housing providers are working with residents from the get-go. So really from the planning phase through, to, through the refurbishment and afterwards guiding in the usage of the building. So I think to get everybody on board for this energy transition, this optimizing how we can work with the key players who are people living in the buildings is going to be crucial. Um, I, we often see when we when we work in legislative um, surroundings, we we can hear conversations that act as if houses are almost like a fridge or a car. Um, but we have to keep in mind people are going to be living in those buildings and they have to be part of the conversation. So I think that's where the social housing sector has learned a lot. I'm not saying it's absolutely perfect, but there's a lot of lessons that have been learned. And then on the non-stop, the the, the one-stop shop, and um, there we see. Particularly one project we were involved in, um, Open Gela, with um, the Spanish public um, housing providers, where you have a quite a low portion of, um, low percentage of, of social housing in, in many uh, Spanish cities and regions. However, the public land and housing providers work um, together with the local authorities to work on this district approach. So finding ways to also provide that necessary information for private home owners so that we don't have a pepper potting approach where you have isolated buildings being renovated and the house next door, which is privately owned, not being renovated. I'm not saying that's easy. That's going to be one of the, the crucial challenges going forward for the renovation wave um, and because of the fragmented ownership. But I think we do have some examples where, where, it, is, where it is working. Thank you very much. Maybe a second question very quickly. So how, how far do you see the cooperation between uh, the social housing operator and uh, uh, the private sector? And what should be or could be uh, the business model, emerging business model in the, the years to come? So the private sector, what do you... You mean uh, the private and home on, owner sector, or you mean the, the energy services or companies or building companies, uh, uh, consortium, uh, including uh, financing uh, uh, solution and so on? Yeah, I mean, this again, this one stop shop approach um, that we see um, being developed can really be provide this um, forum for this type of collaboration because. Once you start to work at the district level, you realize that that collaboration between the private sector, between energy uh, performance contractors is really crucial. And if you have that, that space um, 
where you can um, achieve that open dialogue, um, we see that that, um, that is crucial. Um, then when it comes to the, the, um, the, the, one of the challenges, obviously we see it also in mixed um, condominiums where some houses have been sold. So they are in the, they are private homes and where we have um, social, um, social housing providers. There we see really a more challenging um, financial framework where really help from local authorities will all, or collaboration with local authorities will also be required to figure out how you fill those financial gaps. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Sarcha. Uh, now uh, the time is running, so we have to move to the next presentation. So I will call uh, on the floor uh, Claudia Kahani uh, to present the Lemon Project. Claudia, the floor is at you. Hello, hello. Good morning to everybody. Thanks very much for inviting uh, to present uh, our project uh, at this event. Um, next slide, thanks. Uh, so I represent here one of the most active uh, and uh, vibrant uh, organizations that uh, uh, work in Italy on uh, climate uh, and mitigation and adaptation uh, projects. We uh, are an, an energy agency, uh, AES. We are based in Modena in the Emilia-Romagna region and we have more than 100 uh, uh, public bodies associated to our uh, organization. And we provide to our public bodies uh, services, technical assistance to implement uh, projects, uh, energy efficiency projects, uh, but also adaptation projects. Uh, next. Next, please. Uh, we uh, used, um, sorry, the previous one. Um, we uh, got used to uh, implement uh, the um, finance, financial uh, products that uh, the European Commission put in place uh, to accelerate investment in the public sector. We have uh, experience in ELENA EAB uh, program, in uh, MLA PDA, H2020 PDA, in EF. We are consultant of the EF Fund in Italy. And also we use uh, a MED program to implement large uh, investment program to the retrofit of the public building and public lighting. And uh, we think this approach is really important for the local authorities because we can, in this way, accelerate uh, the, the retrofit um, rate. Otherwise, uh, if, we, if we still move uh, one building by, by one building retrofit, we will not achieve uh, our objective of uh, uh, reduction uh, of uh, energy consumption and CO2 emissions in the residential and, uh, and the building sector. Next. So today I would like to uh, present to you the result of the LEMON project. Next. Uh, the LEMON project is, was supported by H2020 PDA uh, program and uh, is, a, is a project that uh, involve uh, the social housing companies in Parma and Reggio Emilia, which are in uh, Emilia-Romagna. And uh, uh, together with ICE, there is also the, another partner, uh, Arter, which is the, the Emilia-Romagna Region Consortium for Innovation and Technology Transfer. And the aim was to uh, implement uh, a retrofit, a large retrofit program in the social housing uh, sector in Parma and Reggio Emilia together with the social housing companies. The next one. So uh, our target was to retrofit 626 uh, uh, dwellings, uh, units, um, and uh, uh, deep retrofitting uh, the, the dwellings and integrating to support the investment program, integrating different forms of funding that are actually available in Italy, uh, funding and incentives uh, from a regional or national um, uh, organization or co-funding from local authority, authorities or uh, um, co-funding from the dwelling owners or from, um, from tenants. Uh, we also included the uh, ESCO's involvement and also the social housing companies. Uh, we wanted to achieve a deep retrofit with a payback period of 15 years. The next one. 
so I would like to uh, highlight the barriers and what we have done, because I think this is most, the most important part uh, of the project. Uh, H2020 PDA project is an innovative project uh, in the framework of uh, H2020. So uh, it's important that uh, um, I think in this kind of project, uh, uh, is project to highlight uh, the innovation that was implemented and the barriers that we uh, identified during the implementation. Uh, as uh, uh, Sorcha mentioned before, the, there is a, a house div housing diversity, and uh, especially in Emilia-Romagna region, the social housing company uh, don't own the, the buildings. Uh, uh, the, the property of the buildings belong to the municipalities, uh, while the social housing company, which are called archers, uh, have only the, uh, the management uh, of, the, of, the pro of, the, of the housing. And, uh, um, and so every project, a retrofitting project, must be approved by the municipality. And this affected a lot of the project because uh, every time that we wanted to have a, a retrofit program, uh, uh, project approved by the, the municipality, even if in the beginning maybe the municipality was uh, uh, agree on the on the program, but after there were uh, problems in uh, approving the the budget, uh, the co-funding. On we had also election in the meanwhile, so uh, sometimes the the, uh, the the priorities, the politics priorities changed before and after the elections. Next one. Also, we had the problem that in some cases, uh, some municipality have a contract with a social housing company that uh, dure uh, five years. But uh, in case of uh, um, the retrofitting, we have a contract with the ESCO of 15 years uh, that uh, are, the contract is between the ESCO and the social housing company. But then uh, the, the contract between the social housing company and the municipality is only for five years. So in some cases, we had to modify this contract and it was not so easy. So uh, from this point of view, I think if the ownership of the buildings and the property is uh, uh, belong to the municipality, the social housing company have a, a very low capacity to aggregate investment and keep it because uh, it was really hard and this affected the, the timeline of the project very much. Next one. Then we have the financial barriers. There are in Italy many funding available for social housing companies. Uh, we have, uh, for example, a national grant, grant that uh, is delivered by the regions. We have structural fund. We have uh, regeneration urban programs. Uh, next one. Uh, we have eco bonus that actually is really important because with the COVID, uh, uh, crisis, it has been increasing under uh, at the hundred ten percent, and um, but uh, during the lemon project was about uh, sixty percent. We have Conto Termico, another national incentive that are only for public administration and the social housing company. We have uh, the possibility to engage an ESCO with uh, third party financing. We could have uh, the co funding for municipalities and. Uh, uh, and also we introduce innovation in, uh, in Lemon that uh, uh, we introduce, introduce the energy performance tenancy agreement that uh, foreseeing the possibility to receive a co-funding from the tenants. So we have uh, uh, many, many incentives that are available, but uh, uh, it's really hard to uh, mix them uh, in, a, in a business plan. And uh, also the, the problem is that uh, in any case, all the money must be anticipated uh, by the social housing company, and then they can uh, uh, have the, the, the payback of the, the investment that they, and with the incentive after um, the works are done. Um, uh, and, and this is really, uh, uh, this affects a lot the, the, the project implementation because uh, they had to anticipate all the money. I would also say that uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, to receive the, the funding, uh, the, this kind of project like Lemon that provide technical assistance was really useful because we could really present many, many applications for structural funds and for national funding uh, and uh, uh, really increasing the, the, the funding uh, uh, of, uh, of the investment program. Next. Uh, as, I, as I say, one of the innovations that we implemented in uh, Lemon was the Energy Performance Tenancy Agreement. 
Uh, this uh, was a, a really interesting part of the project because we, we think that also the tenants uh, should pay uh, the investment, uh, the retrofit program. So what we have been done is to uh, uh, develop a regulation that was approved by all the municipalities of the provinces of Palma and Emilia. Uh, this regulation was transformed into a scheme that foreseen that uh, the 70% of the energy saving uh, uh, had to be uh, moved to the Archer and the 30% could be uh, uh, remain on tenants. Uh, this means that uh, uh, in, in money, uh, we calculate that the, aver the, the average of the energy saving for each dwelling uh, in Lemon project was 400 euro per year. It means that uh, uh, 280 euro could uh, uh, be paid back from the tenants to the Archer, the social housing, while 120 euro could be keep, kept by, by the, could benefit the, the tenants. So this uh, uh, means that uh, about the, the Archer, the social housing company could increase the, the tenant fee by 20, year, 20 euro per month. Uh, in this way, in 15 years, we could uh, uh, have 6,000 uh, euro paid by the tenants uh, to integrate our business plan. Uh, I mean, this scheme was not uh, uh, implemented by other municipalities, uh, uh, but could be an, an option. If, if the municipality had to co-finance high, high, the high part of the investment, uh, uh, this could be an option and uh, some municipality used it because they couldn't otherwise uh, provide this amount of money. Next one. One of the other bias was uh, on the on the ESCOs. Uh, in Italy, the ESCOs, and I think uh, most of the other countries, uh, come from the maintenance and um, facilities and utilities uh, uh, business. And uh, uh, if we implement the retrofit of the buildings, we have most of the wars that are, are, are about 90% of the wars that uh, are on the envelope, so insulation and windows, and few investments are on, uh, on the plants. So uh, at least uh, the, the ESCO don't find a lot of profit uh, in uh, deep retrofit, especially in the residential sector, um, where we have many autonomous bowlers. Uh, in, uh, in Lemon, uh, about 80% of the buildings have autonomous boilers, so um, really, uh, this really uh, uh, affected the project because uh, uh, the ESCOs the, the couldn't find a real uh, interesting uh, business in, uh, in this kind of project. So, uh, also the um, incentives that are available at national level, like Conto Termico, that uh, we used in, uh, in our business plan, um, they, don't, they don't identify this as uh, equity because they, um, I mean, you can, uh, as I told you before, you can receive this amount only after you have done, uh, realized the investment, the work, and uh, uh, there is a high rate of uh, uh, application that are not successful in receiving this initiative. So, uh, the ESCO do not consider this uh, as a, a equity. Next one. Another fact that uh, increased the risk of our business plan was the uh, presence of private owners that are 9% in the public building. So uh, we have often uh, buildings that are almost all uh, uh, the, the dwellings are public, but some dwellings are private owned. So uh, they have to co-finance the investment and, uh, uh, and the ESCO have to ask them the money back. So uh, this increases a lot the risk of the investment for them. So in order to attract the, the ESCO uh, in our business model, um, we move, uh, we allocated uh, the incentives on Archer and uh, uh, we uh, identify a, a way to guarantee the landlord, so the private owners uh, and the social housing company set up a, a social fund that could give a guarantee to uh, the, the private owners. Uh, and uh, we had to ensure high quantity of, uh, 
of equity. This was really important. Otherwise, uh, the, the ESCOs were not interested in the project. And I think uh, this, this point is really crucial. Uh, if we don't have any guarantee, then uh, um, the, the equity must be increased. Next one. Uh, then we have the bank's barriers. I, I say that uh, uh, the, the social housing company have many incentives, but they have antis to anticipate this amount. So we need, uh, uh, we had to uh, uh, identify a loan, but uh, this was really unsuccessful activity. Uh, the social housing companies uh, uh, also published a, a call to identify a bank that was interested in uh, co-fund the, the investment. Uh, but uh, uh, this was not uh, successful. They, they don't have the property of the of the dwelling, so they cannot provide a guarantee to the banks. And also, we found out that uh, despite the uh, European Commission uh, support this uh, larger investment program, local banks are not interested in uh, support of this uh, uh, this investment. They prefer to fragment the investment at building level and provide the the, the loan to each building. So we 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 had to to, uh, to split our investment program in by buildings. That is not uh, interesting because we were working on a large investment program. And uh, um, um, and then uh, so uh, what we uh, the solution that we identify in the end is that we introduce it in the energy performance contract uh, the obligation for the ESCO to identify a financial uh, body that could uh, uh, support uh, the, the archers, the social housing company in, uh, in getting a loan. So the, also the financing is inside the energy performance contract. Next one. So I will not explain this, but I just wanted to know that uh, the, the Lemon project was really complex because in the social housing, you have many actors, many fundings, uh, many uh, procedures and uh, many bureaucracy that uh, should be implemented. So the complexity is really high. And, uh, um, and this is the reason why we, it, it was so complex, the project. Next one. Uh, what we have done is to uh, develop the uh, feasibility study, energy audits, business plan, uh, 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 also um, uh, tender documents for the retrofit program. Uh, we, our goal was uh, about 600 dwellings, but uh, uh, as I said, many municipalities didn't approve the, uh, the investment program in the end, so we had to increase the dwellings. Uh, assessed and uh, in the end we engaged 27 municipalities uh, uh, with more than 800 uh, dwellings and uh, also uh, we had to engage uh, uh, in the in the final uh, retrofit program uh, we have also uh, 59 landlords private owners next one um, due to the, um, the, the fact that uh, uh, some uh, uh, grants uh, or structural funds had uh, uh, deadlines and we had to spend urgently, we could not uh, uh, keep the, uh, the baseline and all the buildings together. So we had to, in some way, uh, to publish work tenders or so traditional tenders, but we introduced uh, uh, a, a performance, energy performance inside the, the work tender, so they were improved a little. And um, in this case, uh, we uh, had the co-funding from the municipalities and from the landlords. And uh, this part uh, included 18 calls with 300 dwellings uh, and investment was, uh, a total investment was uh, more than 4 million of euro. Next one. Then we have the, uh, a more consistent uh, um, uh, tender that uh, is a EPC tender. Here we have uh, 323 dwellings uh, and the business plan is really, uh, is really complex because we had to put together all the co-funding as, uh, as I told you before. And we have grants and subsidies uh, that we could collect together um, uh, uh, with application 
uh, that we delivered uh, to structural funds or national funding. And uh, we have the co-funding uh, that is provided by the municipalities. And this part was anticipated by uh, the ESCO and the, um, and the financing partner of the ESCO. Um, and then we have the co-funding from the ESCO and the co-funding from the landlords. Next one. And uh, here is uh, um, the, the kind of, uh, of uh, tender we publish is a service and work tender, is APC tender that is based on service. And uh, um, here you can see uh, that we, inside uh, the tender, we have so the, the supply service and the maintenance service. And uh, the total cost of the, of the tender was uh, um, 5 million 200 about. Next one. So I have two examples of buildings here. Uh, this one is uh, uh, the first example is a uh, aggregation of buildings uh, where we have uh, 175 dwellings. Uh, among them, uh, 150 are um, uh, owned are, are social housing, while the others are private. The building is uh, from the 1980. Uh, five floors. Uh, and uh, here we implemented with the lemon project insulation um, of the of the buildings border substitution of building substitution. The total budget here is um, two uh, million, almost three million of the investment, and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, two million point six from a, a national uh, law. And uh, um, and uh, another one hundred eighty-five thousand uh, euro from uh, uh, the national incentive conto termico, but uh, um, this uh, uh, building is almost uh, co-funded uh, by in, national incentives. But I would say that uh, uh, this is really attractive for the ESCO, and uh, while the others building that we have in the call. Uh, they're not so much attractive, but this building was really training, uh, was really uh, leading the, the EPC tender. And uh, uh, with, this, with this retrofit that was almost uh, uh, all paid by, by, by national funding, we could uh, integrate with other buildings that was, were not so interesting for the ESCO. And uh, I will also say that uh, with the, uh, the deep retrofit of the buildings, we achieved the 39% of the energy saving but we move from a, a we, we move from a f energy energy uh, class to a, a c uh, energy class so um, the idea that we can achieve uh, um, a, a or b energy class is really ambitious really next one and uh, this is a building that uh, was not so um, interesting for the ESCO, but we could include in the APC tender because we had the, the, the other intervention. So I just reported two of them, but there are many buildings. Um, uh, this one was uh, composed by nine dwellings. Uh, five were uh, social housing while the other were private. And uh, here we have all the retrofit uh, intervention that are related to uh, generator, gender replacement. Uh, um, uh, we have uh, heat metering. Uh, in, all the, in all the buildings, we implement a smart metering. So I think this is really important. And the insulation, a replacement of, of, uh, of windows. So deep retrofit, uh, even here, the energy saving 20%. It's really hard to achieve very high uh, energy um, uh, retrofit uh, goals. And here uh, we need the co-funding of uh, the landlord, landlord of 21,000 uh, uh, euro. Next one. I also want to mention uh, the materials we produce, uh, we produce the, during Lemon Project. I think this one is really useful for the other social housing. And uh, uh, is a tenants for manual, is in English as well. And there is a guideline for the tenants on how to use uh, in, more, in, more, in a more responsible uh, uh, way uh, the, the, the dwellings uh, and uh, reduce uh, uh, the energy consumption, but also increase uh, the comfort inside the, um, the buildings. 
So I guess I finished it. Yes. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia, uh, for this really interesting and impressive project. And I speak uh, of experience having implemented a similar, uh, very complex project with a different budget line and uh, contractual uh, parties. So this is really impressive. You have several questions from uh, the attendees. I will select some, some, some of them. Uh, and the first one, indeed, uh, do you consider that the Lemon project uh, could be replicated in other Italian municipalities? And uh, does uh, uh, the Modena Energy Agency plan to uh, deliver support or uh, services for other municipalities in Emilia Romagna? Yes, I, I would like to, to inform that um, uh, before Lemon, we had uh, uh, only one social housing company associated to ICE. Now we have seven social housing companies. And uh, we, um, I mentioned before that uh, in Italy now we have this uh, eco bonus uh, that uh, moved from the 60% to 110%. So the deep retrofit the build of the buildings uh, can be um, uh, discounted in the tax. Uh, and uh, you can uh, move, uh, transfer your credit, your tax credit to the ESCO. So, and have the investment for free, uh, at least. So uh, it cannot be implemented in all the buildings, uh, but if you, in some buildings, uh, this can be possible. So uh, this is really important. This uh, will do only one year. Maybe uh, there is a possibility to extend it a little bit, but uh, this will support uh, uh, the social housing companies in a, uh, in, a, in in develop a, a investment program, and we are supporting a four social housing companies that just started uh, to uh, replicate Lemon with uh, the the support of these uh, incentives that is very attractive. But uh, even if we have this kind of uh, incentives, uh, the facilitation activities in the beginning is uh, really crucial, I think, because uh, the Social housing companies don't do not have the competence uh, to deal this kind of project. It's too uh, large, and the the business uh, the business plan is really complex. Even if you have uh, the investment uh, that are uh, ninety percent supported by uh, um, by national incentives, uh, what uh, we are thinking also is to. Um, use uh, uh, this opportunity of eco bonus that cover most of the investment to integrate other kind of investment in the uh, in the buildings like uh, adaptation climate adaptation or maybe it could be interesting also to include in the energy performance contract also social services that uh, include not only the uh, the climate services, but also uh, the, uh, the, to provide social services for elderly people, for example, or for people that uh, have uh, uh, social problems. So I think uh, uh, coming back to a systemic approach, um, this is, uh, I mean, uh, having uh, the retrofit program supported by uh, incentives is important because you can enlarge the impact of the action that should not be only related to the energy efficiency, should be related also to the social impact and also to the adaptation to the climate change, I think, and also to the mobility, for example. We could integrate the retrofit with mobility services. Uh, I think uh, uh, if we don't have the retrofit supported, uh, then uh, it's really important to approach uh, because uh, the social uh, the social problem of the social housing is too uh, impacting the uh, the building. So we have to include this in some way in the retrofit program. I cannot hear you, Jean. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, maybe a, a second question very quickly. Uh, how does work um, the um, social fund that has been set up by the region and uh, is it still active and how it has been created uh, uh, and is the region the only owners of uh, the fund? The social fund? 
Ah, it's mentioned in your presentation. Just uh, focus on it. Ah, the social fund. Yeah, is yeah. uh, this is uh, experimented by the social housing of Reggio Emilia, and uh, uh, they fed it uh, with a discount from the work tender. You know, you also have discount when you public uh, work tender, and uh, with the discount, uh, they uh, fed this uh, social fund that provide a guarantee. Uh, for the private owners uh, uh, that have to fund the investment. Otherwise, uh, the investment cannot be implemented. If they are, do not agree on the investment program, they, uh, they need to be to agree. And so in some cases, the, the social, uh, um, I mean, they are fragile from families anyway. So even if they, they are the owner of the, the dwellings, they, they are not very, uh, they don't have the capacity to co-fund the investment. So, uh, this guarantee is really important. Uh, Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, you mentioned the eco bonus uh, system in Italy. Uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, currently some projects uh, intend to address the development of an integrated solution uh, to fund uh, uh, the eco bonus uh, through ESCOs uh, in the future. I hope that uh, this kind of solution could be quickly uh, developed. And this is also uh, the interesting transition for the next uh, presentation from uh, Mr. Tanguy de Rousseau that will explain uh, how does work uh, uh, the European EU investment uh, uh, <laughs> funding uh, tools and how to develop uh, investment platform and why is it in interesting uh, to address market failure within the, mar the financing market. So Mr. Tanguy de Rousseau, I uh, give you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Francois. Um, so thank you for giving us the opportunity of presenting the uh, EIB. Um, the, the previous presenter, Claudia, you mentioned the difficulty to get uh, financing. Uh, here, I would be talking about uh, bank financing indeed, uh, rather than subsidies uh, that are sometimes required to, to finance social housing projects. But uh, uh, for now, it will be the experience of lending to the social housing sector in Europe. Can I have the next slide, please, Nathan? Thank you. So uh, the uh, European Union Bank, the European Investment Bank, is, uh, uh, is about improving the, uh, the quality of life of uh, people in Europe uh, and beyond. 90% uh, of our activity is the, in the member states. Um, we, are, we act as the world's uh, largest multilateral lender. I will give you figures in a minute. And uh, the focus, especially with our ambition to become the uh, climate bank, is pretty much to provide uh, climate finance or provide finance with an impact on the climate. Um, it is owned uh, and governed by the uh, 27 member states. Um, so they are uh, our shareholders. Uh, they don't finance us. Uh, I will come to that in a second. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, where does our money come from? Well, basically we borrow it on the financial markets. We issue bonds, uh, about 60 billion uh, euros a year, and we uh, lend it uh, for the financing of a project, uh, passing the uh, very attractive conditions we have with our uh, external rating of AAA to our uh, clients that borrow from us. Um, we, have, uh, we are headquartered in Luxembourg, a, a bit more than 3,000 uh, people, and have also external uh, representation offices in uh, 50 countries. So I'll be very quick with those slides because we want to come back to social housing. Uh, in terms of volumes, I mentioned uh, 60 billion from, uh, for the EIB. There's also 10 billion of support, which is providing by a subsidiary, the uh, European Investment Fund uh, by way of guarantees uh, mainly. Next, please. So the, the way you would uh, spread the 60 billion is in uh, four main quarters, uh, which are priorities, uh, innovation, the environment, infrastructure, and small and medium enterprising. Uh, social housing fits uh, pretty much uh, into the infrastructure uh, component here. Uh, but obviously we look at it from uh, an environmental perspective, as I will uh, say in a second. Next slide, please. 
So out of those 60 billion, about one third of our lending activity uh, focuses on uh, climate change adaptation or mitigation. Um, we, um, energy efficiency would be the main component uh, that we will focus on today uh, for social housing. And you see that 4.6 billion is uh, uh, a pretty large chunk of this uh, 60 billion already. And that, uh, that can only increase, I would say. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, we provide a, a mixture of loans. That's the, the most uh, important size guarantees, as I said before, with the EIF. But uh, also some quasi-equity investments. I put equity here because it's uh, uh, the innovative portion of what we can do uh, directly or indirectly. We don't uh, take shares in uh, entities, but we could uh, provide some uh, junior debt um, in, in support of a project that acts as a uh, equity. Advisory is uh, a very important component. Uh, a previous presenter mentioned uh, Elena. Uh, as far as uh, um, social housing is concerned, that would be Urbis. That would be quite important as well. The combination of the lending uh, and advisory, what we call blending, is uh, pretty much uh, our value added uh, compared to uh, um, other banks. Next slide, please. So why do uh, borrowers come to the EIB? Uh, well, typically they are looking for large amounts. Uh, I would say typically the uh, uh, size of our loans in the, is in the region of 100 million euros. Uh, it was a bit less than that with the uh, Juncker plan with the uh, FC. Uh, I think it reduced to 70 million. You see that these are pretty large amounts. Uh, the, uh, the downside of it is means it's not accessible to any project but it is one of our benefits uh, of being a large uh, investment bank. Um, I would just say the long maturities is very important, especially when uh, you're looking at the construction uh, of new buildings. We can also provide long maturities uh, for uh, energy uh, retrofitting, as we will see in a second. Um, interest rates are very attractive because we are not for profit organization. So all the, uh, uh, good rates that we attract on the market, we pass on to our clients. Um, the, I, I think the presenter, Paola, at the beginning uh, mentioned the uh, necessity to leverage external financing. Uh, for us, it is very important to attract uh, other banks, uh, private banks, um, national promotional banks to uh, the, the financing that uh, or to the project that we support. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, we could provide uh, either direct loans or intermediated loans. Um, on this slide, you'll see that what we call the large scale projects are typically more than 25 million euros. Uh, we would typically finance up to 50% of those loans. Um, in practice, uh, uh, Claudia mentioned the, uh, the lengthy process and the complexity of dealing with the EIB. Uh, it could be true to some extent because we have a very thorough uh, project appraisal process. Uh, it means that uh, in practice, we will look at the larger projects or combination of large projects. Um, when, uh, what I mean by intermediate loans is that we uh, work together with commercial banks and national promotional banks to intermediate, intermediate uh, EIB money. Um, uh, again, that sometimes we have a small project and that's uh, it's a good way to aggregate this project, which was one of the uh, points raised uh, uh, before. Uh, in that case, when we do intermediate lending, it's not EIB that is taking the credit decision to finance a project or another one. It is the intermediary bank. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, this, uh, the, the, the criteria for or the requirements uh, to support a project is that we need to assess the viability of the project. So we look at it from different angles. We look at it from the financial angle being a bank. We want uh, to get our money back. Uh, we want it to be uh, eligible, so to meet uh, one of our objectives. Uh, here, uh, we would be looking at uh, um, 
climate change for social housing. We are looking at the eligibility uh, amongst the uh, social infrastructure criteria. And then uh, obviously we look at the project as EAB from a technical perspective. We want to make sure that the project are technically viable uh, using the, uh, the, the, um, the, the latest uh, standards and uh, have a likelihood to succeed. We look at the socio-economic profitability. We look at the environmental uh, impact of our projects. And we look uh, very importantly also at uh, procurement. Um, in a previous presentation, you've heard, uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Yosha who uh, said uh, that there was a, an issue at the moment in one of the countries with an infringement procedure. Uh, indeed, uh, we need to follow the uh, EU guidelines for procurement. That is very important for us. Next slide, please. Um, now to the European Fund for Strategic Investments, or the Juncker Plan. Um, the plan expires at the end of this year. So I think we can look at it just uh, to remind ourselves of what was available under the plan. The successor is InvestEU. We don't yet have the full details of InvestEU and what it can support. But if you would want to remember to, uh, to remember just one point, uh, FC was about uh, supporting riskier projects, projects that didn't uh, take off uh, bec because we, uh, they, they were lacking financing. And that's what the uh, FC, the European Fund for Strategic Investment did. Um, in a nutshell, the provision of guarantees by the EU and by the EIB allowed us uh, to um, undertake some uh, financing to the order of 100 billion, uh, supporting investments uh, of about 500 billion. So you see the, uh, the, the huge leverage effect. And um, some projects which were riskier or which were more difficult to finance benefited from this guarantee. Uh, so we, uh, I think at this stage, we can say it was a very successful program and InvestEU uh, is supposed to uh, take the best of it and integrate also other mandates uh, going forward as part of the new uh, programming period. Next slide, please. So um, all in all, uh, as of the end of 2019, uh, more than 1,000 transactions have been approved. More transactions will be approved until the uh, end of December of this year. Um, so uh, the, this, the financing was uh, more than 80 billion, and as I said before, close to 500 billion euros. Next slide, please. The um, examples I wanted to uh, give you today, especially in the social uh, housing environment, is uh, co-financing arrangements that uh, we have supported under FC. Um, these co-financing uh, arrangements uh, mean that uh, what FC did for those projects was um, to allow a project to be uh, aggregated uh, under the form of programs or platforms uh, so that we could uh, finance several projects but financing one vehicle. The, the first example, Adestia. Uh, Adestia is a subsidiary of uh, the National Promotional Bank, uh, CDC in France, uh, CDC Habitat. And basically what we did is we supported uh, the um, uh, energy refurbishment of uh, more than 20,000 uh, uh, dwellings um, by reinforcing uh, the equity that CDC had in 13 social housing organizations. So it acted a bit like quasi-equity, but it was uh, a loan uh, to this uh, CDC subsidiary. Uh, the second one uh, is also a very large program with uh, the CDC group in, in France. Uh, so energy efficiency, as the name uh, says, uh, and here we were uh, looking at financing um, a number of small projects, uh, some of which under the backing of FC, uh, because some of the social um, housing organizations uh, presented a higher credit risk profile um, allowing us to um, uh, access the guarantee from FC. 
The third one is the one that we will focus on in the, in the next uh, few slides, Réseau Canopé. What, what it is, uh, uh, Réseau means network. It means that it's a grouping of uh, social housing organizations that uh, came together to seek financing uh, from the EIB. So that could be a recipe for success. The, the last two transactions I'm a bit less familiar with because uh, I'm uh, covering uh, the financing operations of, uh, um, of uh, France, uh, Benelux uh, and Ireland. Uh, and here, these, these are aggregated programs uh, and expanded beyond pure social housing to affordable housing as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so Réseau Canopé, it's both uh, the construction of uh, new social housing dwellings and uh, the refurbishment. Um, the, the quantum is quite a significant more than 1,000 uh, new built and 4,000 plus uh, uh, refurbishment. Um, uh, aggregated, it, was, uh, it came up to four loans of 107 million euros. Uh, you see that the tenor is uh, pretty long for 24 years. Um, we signed those transactions a couple of years ago and in January of last year. Uh, basically, what uh, the borrowers were, uh, they, they are um, four um, social housing organizations uh, backed by local authorities in the north of France. And basically, they realized that uh, in a context where uh, the uh, local regulation encourage them to uh, group, uh, to, to, to regroup their development and form a group. Uh, they uh, created a group monde d'intérêt commun in order to um, work together, look at the uh, programs uh, together and seek financing together. So basically what they did, rather than one of them coming to the EIB with uh, maybe a 20 million uh, euro program, and uh, we would have to say, well, uh, sorry, it is difficult to finance directly. Um, uh, they came together uh, with a program uh, having similarities, allowing us to have one project appraisal, and it allowed us uh, to support it. Uh, the reason why um, it was uh, done with the FC guarantee is because of the uh, credit profile, uh, which was not uh, purely public sector and required some support. Um, uh, typically, the support is provided by local authorities. Here, in that instance, it benefited from the EFC guarantee. You'll see that um, the uh, uh, CDC, the National Pro Promotion Bank, was also uh, a financier for this transaction, even more than uh, uh, the EIB. Um, and uh, actually, most of the uh, social housing uh, entities in France go via CDC, and we are also teaming up with CDC uh, as uh, such as said before with the, uh, the, the latest partnership agreement that we've signed in mid of September. Um, interesting also on this slide is to see that uh, the EIB loan could be combined with other uh, uh, EU grants, uh, so that it's not restrictive. Uh, and it means that uh, the aggregation of these various forms of financing uh, forms this uh, platform. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I would say that going forward, and as far as social housing is concerned, uh, Réseau Canopé was uh, a bit of an exception, taking advantage of FC. But what we realized is that it was important to be able to uh, have um, an open offer, uh, which was um, uh, reaching as far as possible in terms of um, uh, beneficiaries. And one of the best ways to do that is to work together with the uh, main partner of social housing in France, that is a uh, group CDC, Banque des Territoires. And therefore we entered into a partnership under the sponsorship of the Union Sociale pour l'Habitat. The slide is in French, sorry, the, uh, you had the English version uh, before in the previous presentation, and also together with the Council of uh, Europe Bank. Um, this partnership will take uh, the, the form of bilateral loans uh, between the uh, EIB and CDC. And the first one is actually currently under signature uh, for 500 million euros. Uh, this is a very significant volume. Um, 
uh, if we were to um, conclude on the um, uh, before going to the next slides uh, to conclude on the uh, the volume to give you an order of magnitude um, uh, over the past uh, eight years to 2019 uh, the EIB supported the social housing sector to the order of uh, uh, more than 10 billion euros. Um, that means uh, more than, uh, well, close to 1.5 billion uh, for every year. Um, that's quite significant. At the, moment, at the same time, uh, you could say it's uh, uh, not that significant compared to the need uh, identified, which was uh, depending on how you look at it, 50 billion per annum or 10 billion per annum for the uh, uh, retrofitting, but still this is a lot of money. So um, I would encourage promoters to, um, uh, to to come to the EIB to present their projects uh, and we'll see whether the, that could be financed directly or indirectly. Next slide, please. On this one, uh, it's a bit the mode d'emploi of uh, how to get uh, financing uh, from the EIB. What uh, you want to retain from this presentation, because time is uh, running, is that on the on the red side, uh, we are not into the support of uh, uh, investment uh, from an investor's perspective, I would say, uh, from the uh, capitalistic side of things. We are on the green side, pretty much policy driven. We're driven by the public interest and we're driven by the interests of uh, beneficiaries of uh, social housing. So um, uh, indeed, we want to support social housing organizations and programs. Uh, we don't want to support uh, investors or speculative investors. Uh, that's another, um, that's an, uh, an, another purpose and it's not ours. Next slide, please. I think that will be the last one. Um, talking about the various products or financial instruments that the EIB uh, can offer, uh, I mentioned uh, direct loans or indirect loans. Here it's across the board. It could be directly or indirectly. Um, typically, we would uh, finance a project by way of investment loans. That's where your projects will be mature enough. That's when we know exactly what we finance from the outset. We could also finance a project via framework loans. And Claudia was saying before that uh, uh, it, it could be lengthy and, and complex. The reason why uh, it's because we don't know exactly which project will be financed when we uh, enter into these framework loans. So we need to actually set the parameters, define the criteria for those loans before we uh, enter into them. So that takes a bit more time than when uh, we know exactly what we will finance. Investment platforms is uh, what we've uh, described with the example of uh, uh, Réseau Canopé. Uh, basically, the idea is to uh, put together projects, put together borrowers. There could be several borrowers in the same platform uh, and um, uh, also working with national promotional banks. Um, <coughs> sorry. And, and the idea of those platforms is to um, enhance the investment uh, here in social housing that would not be possible uh, via the, the direct investment loans uh, or uh, the framework loans. Advisory, I mentioned a bit before, that's uh, another of the uh, product offer. It's not directly financing. But also, they could be financing in the form of subsidy, with us for um, uh, Elena, as I said before. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. De Rousseau. <clears throat> uh, as far as I have a, a look uh, within the portfolio of uh, EFSI uh, uh, engagement, uh, there were about uh, 60 uh, investment platform uh, that were created through the, the framework. Over the 1,270 uh, operation, so this is not a lot of investment platform, but uh, uh, at the opposite, uh, they represent about 40 billion euro of uh, levering leveraging capacity uh, on over 500 billion euro that were 
was the objective of EFSI. So this illustrates uh, the aggregation capacity of investment platform and the interest to use that kind of tools uh, through uh, the next uh, InvestEU framework. Maybe one question, Mr. De Rousseau, uh, how do you see uh, the role of investment platform in the next AU, InvestEU framework? Uh, will, it, will it increase? And uh, specifically for the social sector, is it uh, really suitable for it? Um. I think we now have uh, experience of the investment platforms. I remember the time uh, before uh, FC uh, where we were talking about investment platforms, but we didn't really know what it was about and how it could work. So um, now I would say for InvestEU, we could capitalize on the experience of uh, having put together some investment platforms. Um, uh, apart from those that we mentioned for social housing, I think there is much more than we can do. Um, we are uh, contemplating uh, such platforms also with the national promotional banks. Uh, that's in France, but also in Belgium, um, uh, possibly in Ireland. Uh, I think the focus on the, of InvestEU will probably be more on um, the... Uh, a subordinated debt instruments than senior debt that FC was a lot about. And I would say that especially in the public sector and social housing is typically considered public sector because of the regulatory support, because of the grant funding uh, of most projects. So I, I, I think that uh, the, in the future with InvestEU, uh, we will be working on designing um, investment platforms that could invest either by way of subordinated debt or providing quasi-equity uh, support. Um, so that would increase the leverage effect. It's probably less money directly available under InvestEU. Doesn't mean that we cannot do it outside InvestEU. Just the example of this 500 million loan to CDC that we are doing at the moment. Uh, but that's, that's how I would see that. Thank you very much. Uh, another question from uh, the attendees. Um, they ask which kind of AU funds can complete uh, the EIB financing, the FSI financing, and basically uh, why bundling uh, funds are interesting and specifically through investment platform. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult to answer for InvestEU, and as far as FC is concerned, uh, we, we've seen that uh, the various uh, SF funds were uh, possible to be combined with uh, EIB money. So I would hope that it's still the case under InvestEU and that uh, uh, flexibility is provided rather than uh, uh, constraints. Um, uh, I would say, how can it be, uh, what is the merit of putting it in an investment platform? I think the merit is, uh, to have a um, red line of uh, a, a, a policy-driven uh, project and get the support from the various angles. We see that in other industries, like for example, in uh, urban transport or sustainable transport, when there is a merit of blending EU funds uh, and EIB money. And uh, the purpose of bundling it together is uh, because uh, sometimes there is, uh, in order to get the subsidies uh, from the Commission, uh, you need to show that you're able to attract uh, funding as well. So I think the benefit of a platform is a bit like in uh, um, well, investment, uh, investment banking, is putting together lenders means that you have a common theme and you can attract more by talking with one, one voice to the many financiers than going on a bilateral basis uh, to, uh, to talk to individual banks that would have their own reactions. I think that's the common theme that will uh, bring the benefits. Thank you very much, Mr. De Rousseau. Um, time is running again, so we are moving to the next presentation and I will let the ground uh, to Jos de Klerk for his uh, uh, specific presentation on uh, EPC contracting uh, in social sector in Belgium. Jos, the ground is for you. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Francois. Um, so I am representing Balfius Bank. Um, 
And maybe to start, I want to profit from the moment to thank uh, Tanguy de Rousseau and his colleagues of the EIB. I can uh, testify that in the last years, we were supported a lot by the EIB in our efforts to have some impact on climate transition in Belgium. We are very thankful to them and I, I come back to them later in the presentation. So um, I will speak to you about the view from a commercial bank about EPC, energy performance, contracting financing for social housing. Please, next slide. Some words of our, about Belfius Bank. We are one of the four major Belgian banks. We are uh, since 2011, 100% state owned Belgian bank. We are an all round bank. Um, maybe what's specific for Belfius is that we are market leader in the public and social sector. Um, you see also that uh, the bank uh, is in very good shape. We have a very solid uh, solvability and liquidity. Um, and what's important here for this presentation maybe is also that as a major bank and also as a 100% as a state owned bank, we have a societal role also in uh, climate action. And our bank has uh, yeah, presented its uh, corporate social responsibility strategy. And you see there in the slide some of our commitments. So it's clear that commercial banks have more and more pressure to, to also take their societal role and they, they need to do action in that. So we cannot afford as a commercial bank to, uh, to let this thing aside. And we are, in, we are, it's not only a strategy, we are trying to realize this strategy. Hello, can we have the next slide? Yes, you can go, go uh, yeah. I, I will uh, try to give you some aspects how a commercial bank is looking to energy performance contracting in uh, social housing. I don't think that it's necessary to give a definition of energy performance contracting. A previous speakers has done it before. But what is very important for a commercial bank is that we need scale. In Belgium, banks has lots of liquidities. The problem is not a lack of funding. The problem is a lack of projects. And certainly, uh, and, and certainly in energy performance in contracting, the market in Belgium is not mature. We have about maybe 10, 15 contracts a year for, for maybe 50, 60 million euros. So you will easily understand that for a commercial bank to make a whole program to finance this kind of EPCs is not evident. Also, the, the scale of an individual project must be enough. I, I think really think that projects with an investment of uh, less than 1 million euro uh, are very difficult to finance. I saw in previous uh, presentations a project of 80,000 euro you will understand that this will take this takes a lot of energy it takes a lot of uh, time and so it's very difficult we need really need enough scale in the in the previous presentation my some colleagues spoke also about the um, yeah the dilemma do we only do an energy retrofit of or are we doing a retro, deep retrofit of the programs? EPC contracts are focusing, the name says it itself, 
on energy performance measures. EPC contracts are most of the time not a good answer for deep retrofit of buildings. But we see that yeah, most of the time when you have a building of 20, 30, 40 years old, you don't only need an energy, energy measures, you, deep, you need a deep retrofit. And so we really have to look how we can combine EPC contracts in deep retrofits. Today, that's not the case. Also, because uh, because uh, ESCOs today are mostly focusing on HVAC and not on uh, really uh, the shell uh, sh uh, building shell measures. In EPC, most of the time we see in Belgium that contracts are have a maturity or eight years, ten years, sometimes twelve years. And they try, in this context, they try that the energy savings are reimbursing the investment. So during the maturity of the contracts, energy savings are repaying the investment. I think that's a good thing. But on the other hand, you will easily understand when you, you need a deep retrofit and also building sh shell measures with a long peer payment, uh, payback period are necessary. This cannot be uh, done with only the energy savings. Another point that is important in, uh, in EPC financing is that in an EPC contract, financing is an option. It's not necessary that the ESCO makes the investments and do, does the financing. Financing is just an option. What I see in Belgium, that maybe in eight on 10 EPC contracts, the financing is not done by the ESCO, but the financing is done by uh, the public entity. Question of risk. It's clear that for a bank, when we are financing EPC contracts, we have two aspects. Uh, we have on the, one, on the one hand, the ESCO, who is a service company. And if this company don't give any more the, maintain, the good maintenance, don't, uh, uh, cannot uh, achieve the, the guarantee that they've given on the energy savings, maybe the final client will not pay. On the other hand, we have the, the risk on the social housing company. And it's clear that social housing companies are not also always examples of uh, companies with good solvability and good liquidity. So there's a double risk for banks uh, to finance this kind of uh, EPC contracts for social housing. Last point that was also marked in a previous presentation is uh, is the dilemma that the social housing company has to invest in energy efficiency measures, but the one who profits from these investments is the tenant, right? because he has to pay his energy bill. And of course, the, the, uh, his energy bill will, will be much lower uh, following the energy efficiency uh, measures. And so it gives a lower energy bill. And the question is how to handle that. You cannot ask, it, it's not a good economic model that the, the owner social housing com company has to uh, invest and that the, the tenant takes all the profit. So you really need, and, and that's a question of, of legislation, you, you really need legislation in which the the tenant has to share an important part of his energy savings, uh, his energy, uh, the, the lowering of his energy invoice with the social housing company. And that asks for really a lot of legislation work. And so we see that that's one of the main points why uh, social housing companies are hesitating to invest. Next slide, please. 
some words about um, one of the programs that we have set up together with the European Investment Bank, the Private Finance for Energy Efficiency program. Uh, we were very happy with this program that we started uh, about uh, in, in 2017. Uh, with the EIB and the aim of this project was to finance energy uh, efficiency projects in Belgium. Next slide, please. You see what, what is the, we called the program not PF or EE, but we yeah, we chose, chose another branding name in Belgium, Belfius uh, BEEP, Belfius Energy Efficiency Package. And you see that the program is, uh, has three main components. First component is an attractive financing. And that's, that's uh, Tanguy spoke about that. Uh, we are an inter intermediary bank and we got, uh, we got uh, attractive financing for the EIB that we, uh, and the advantage we, we gave it to our customers. Nowadays, as Belgian banks are so, uh, have so full of liquidity, we don't need any more the financing of the EIB. Nevertheless, this helped us a lot in the, in the past um, when the market conditions were more difficult. What's the most important support of the EIB in the PFRE program is the portfolio guarantee. The EIB guarantees us that 80% of our expected losses on the portfolio that we construct will be covered by them. So the EIB is not giving an individual guarantee for each file, but it's giving a portfolio guarantee. With this guarantee, we are feeling rather comfortable and we can give loans on a more flexible way. That means that we can take more risks. As I have spoken to you of the risk of EPC financing, you will understand that this portfolio guarantee gives us the po possibility to de develop specific uh, financing schemes for um, EPC contracts. Um, uh, a third part of the program is that we also uh, partially reimbursing energy audit costs. So you see the, what we are financing with this PFRE program. Uh, but uh, yeah, the most important point is also uh, is as you see energy efficiency in existing buildings. Next slide, please. Yes, our program is still running till uh, the end of uh, next year. Uh, we have, a, we have uh, an engagement to, uh, to develop a portfolio of 75 million euro. Uh, today we are almost halfway. Uh, as Tangi said, uh, the advantage is that we can have uh, a loan still with a maturity of uh, 20 years, which is very good, I think. And you also see that we can, uh, it, it's not a program to finance really very big projects. It's a, a, low, a program to, uh, to finance projects with maximum 10 million, uh, yeah, project cost of maximum 10 million a year. Next slide. Just some examples of uh, EPC financing that we have done. And the first example is of the Foyer André Lectoire. The Foyer André Lectoire is a Brussels social housing company. It's uh, the biggest Brussels, Brussels social housing company. And they are managing about 3,700 uh, dwellings in Brussels, mostly in apartment buildings. Uh, you see here, uh, a contract that was an uh, EPC contract that was concluded by uh, Luminous Solutions, uh, one of the ESCOs that are active in, uh, active in Belgium, who is also a utility in Belgium. So the contract was about uh, yeah 2,400 dwellings, uh, so uh, two thirds of the total dwellings of the social housing company. Of course, the EPC contract was a 
uh, for the work that they have done. In the next slide, you see what they have done in this project. Um, you see uh, yeah, 31 new gas boilers, also cogeneration. Cogeneration uh, is very useful in these Brussels apartment buildings, also because they, they can profit of a very interest, in, interesting uh, yeah, uh, incentive mechanism of the Brussels region. Um, also fo photovoltaic units and also on the radi radiators, they, they put other valves, uh, as you see. So it was a rather large energy efficiency program in apartment buildings. And uh, in the next slide, you see what they have um, maybe uh, to have an idea. This, pro this project was about an investment of uh, 5 million euros. And the guarantee uh, was that uh, each year 266,000 euro on energy uh, consumption would be saved. Uh, I had seen the results of the, of the first year and the results was, uh, was achieved. But you will understand when we have a 12 year contract and when the energy saving on a yearly basis is 260,000 euro. That energy saving alone is not responsible for the reimbursement of the total investment. Here, the, the financing was done by, by Belfius Bank. We financed the ESCO uh, with a direct investment loan of about 90% of the investment cost. And um, so this, this project is, is maybe one of the biggest EPC uh, projects in Belgium in uh, social housing. And so it's a very interesting case. And, and it's win-win it's for all the parties because for the Luminous Solution, it's interesting because they have a lot of, uh, yeah, they can cluster a lot of different projects in one big project. So there are, there's a scale advantage but also for the social housing company, it's a very interesting program. Next slide, please. I, uh, I want to present this, uh, this uh, case because you can finance, when we finance EPC, we can do that via direct investment loan to the ESCO. But we have developed also a financing via a forfeiting mechanism. And I want to give uh, some, I, I want to say some words about this forfeiting mechanism. Here you see a project that we have done in a school uh, in Flanders, uh, an EPC project that was done by an ESCO uh, called Watson. It's, an, it's a small project, but it's an interesting project. Um, because it was one of the first EPC projects in school. And in this uh, project, the, um, the energy savings were reimbursing totally the investment over a contract uh, duration of 14 years. And you see the results of, uh, of, of the yeah, engagement of the ESCO towards the energy savings. Next slide, please. Just some words about, yeah, if you want to push another time on the slides. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I, I would just in some minutes explain to you how this forfeiting mechanism to finance EPC con contracts works. And first you see in the figure, there's the energy performance contract between the ESCO and the project owner. The bank is not a party in that energy performance contract. The bank has no direct contractual relation with the project owner. We only, in forfeiting, we only have a contract, a sale of receivable contracts with the ESCO. What happens? In the EPC contract, we try to split the payment in three payment streams. 
you have a payment stream for the investment, you have a payment stream for the maintenance, and you have a payment stream eventually for the bonus models. Um, and these payment streams are split. So when, it, when, when the investment has been done, you have the provisional acceptance, and from that moment, the payments are starting. What are we doing then? The ESCO is selling us the receivables only for the EE investment. So we don't have a financing to the ESCO, but we, we are purchasing the receivables specifically and only the receivables for the EE investment. After, when we have done the purchase, we send a notification to the project owner that the, the, this receivable for the e-investment he has to pay to us and no longer to the ESCO. Why are we doing this forfeiting mechanism? For different reasons. It's important because we, some, a lot of ESCOs are asking us for a solution that should be off balance for the ESCO. So they don't want for a, for a period of 10 or 15 years, the receivables on their balance sheets. Forfeiting is the only way to make it off balance for the ESCO. But it's also very interesting for the project owner, because what are we doing here? We are making a split between the credit risk taken by the bank and the performance risks that stays with the ESCO. So after purchasing the receivables, we have only a credit risk on the project owner. You will understand that when the bank has only the credit risk, that uh, that we uh, that we are only uh, yeah that that the interest rate can be much lower. So this is really uh, an interesting mechanism that we have done several times now, and uh, we want to develop it further. But I think that it's uh, it's also an advantage because we can finance hundred percent of the project with this forfeiting mechanism. Next slide, please. Yes, I uh, I don't have the time anymore to to handle this slide, but just maybe maybe a word. We were in a very interesting uh, Horizon 2020 project with uh, uh, with other parties uh, and renovates project, and. It was a project about uh, deep retrofit of social housing in Holland. It was based on, on the null of the meter warning and energy neutral uh, houses in, in Holland. And this retrofit of the project, it had a cost of about 80,000 euro. Okay. And I just wanted to show you that because you will understand when the energy costs that was before before retrofit 1800 euro per year this uh, this energy cost became zero when you have a project cost of 80000 80, uh, euro you cannot reimburse that only with uh, 1800 euro a year so it it would have taken maybe 50 60 years to reimburse that so uh, let's let's be be clear and, and realistic. Also, it's not with energy savings. Mostly, not only with en energy savings that uh, this big investment pr retrofit projects can be reimbursed. So I came to the last slide. Then um, just my conclusions as a banker. I will not uh, repeat what I have said before, but you see the con conclusions. Financing via EPC is very interesting. It's complicated. It's sometimes uh, we are working in a market that's not mature. 
you really uh, need mechanism in which the tenant contributes uh, in repayment of the investment. But it's a, it's a very interesting um, way of uh, of doing the energy retrofits, and we are uh, yeah also it's clear that the needs uh, of social housing retrofits are very big also in Belgium, and we are prepared to invest more in uh, this financing. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joost. Uh, we you have several questions, and but we are running out of time, so we will address only one very quickly. So, yeah. in case of uh, in case of the energy saving are not sufficient to pay back the loans, who paid the differences? Yeah, and then most of the time, yeah, of, of course, uh, when we are giving a loan, we are expecting that the loan is reimbursed. So. Uh, so reimbursement has has to be done by the social housing company, yeah, and and then uh, we see that that uh, as I've seen in, in the Italian example, uh, I saw really a lot of uh, yeah government incentives. I think that in Belgian government incentives are are much lower. So this this is really a problem. Uh, I, I think. Um, so what what is done then in Belgium and that is the advantage uh, it it is are the Belgian regions that are yeah, guaranteeing loans that has that are done for the social housing so that makes financing much more easy but of course the difference has to be paid by the social housing company if it's not done by the yeah, by the subsidy. Thank you very much, Joost. So we come to the end of uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, unfortunately, we are over the timing. So I will uh, shorten my conclusion uh, on what we have learned uh, today simply by telling you that uh, the presentation of uh, the speakers will be available on uh, the website. Uh, there were uh, the website of uh, the Sustainable Energy Investment Forum. There were a lot of questions that were uh, also uh, addressed through the system. We were not able to answer all the questions, but we will uh, treat them later and uh, reply to you by email uh, as soon as possible. So I would like to uh, thank all the speakers uh, having uh, presenting their uh, uh, experience and uh, their insight within uh, the uh, social housing renovation uh, challenge. I hope that uh, the attendants had, have some uh, good learnings uh, about uh, the initiatives that are uh, ongoing uh, within the sector. And I wish you a very good day and I hope that we can see you again uh, in the next uh, webinar uh, in or next event of the Sustainable Energy Investment Forum. Thank you very much. Uh, see you next time.